Good afternoon. It's very exciting and inspiring to be here with so many great uh, women leaders and also some brave men uh, in the room, all committed to tackle our greatest global challenges. And I'm really grateful to get the chance to talk to you, building on Sandrine's fantastic presentation this morning, what food got to do with all these challenges. Let me start uh, recognizing that there are so many great things about food, things that make food important. Obviously, it's the sensory experience, it's about nurturing our bodies, it's about livelihoods for billions of people around the world, it connects us with nature, it connects us with each other, and it also shapes our values, our cultures, even our identities. However, our food system, and then I mean the complex web of activities that are involved in the way we produce, process, distribute and consume food, that system is currently failing both us and our planets. Except for one thing, and that is that the food system is actually doing exactly what it was designed to do. It produces vast amounts of cheap calories. However, this has come at the expense of people and planetary health. To start with the health side, currently our food system is making us sick and literally killing us. On the one hand, we have more than 800 million people that now go hungry, and the number is on the rise. And on the other hand, we have more than 2 billion people that are now either overweight or obese. And if we add the another roughly 2 billion people that are uh, deficient in micronutrients like vitamin A or iron, half the world's population is malnourished. And that is pretty well known for a food system that is supposed to nurture us. Uh, when it comes to diets, bad diets have now become the biggest driver, biggest risk factor for uh, illness and premature mortality. One out of five vets annually is linked to bad diets, and food is now killing more people than alcohol, tobacco, drugs, and unsafe sex combined. Even if the food system didn't kill us, uh, it would still be life-threatening, because first and foremost, it's a massive climate problem. One third of the annual emissions is due to food systems and the way we produce and consume. That is six times shipping and aviation combined. And food systems must do more than going to net zero by mid-century. Food systems actually have to go to become net carbon sinks, absorbing and storing huge amounts of carbon if we, ha if we are to stand even a tiny chance of staying below two degrees down to 1.5 degrees. So basically, the message here on this slide, fixing climate is about the energy transition and the food system transformation. Rest is footnotes. Then on nature, food and food production is the single biggest cause of deforestation and biodiversity loss. There are now around 28,000 species in danger of extinction, according to the IUCN Red List and 24,000 of these species are directly threatened by agriculture. And agriculture now occupies half the world's habitable land. And modern food production is also depleting our soil, it's depleting freshwater reserves, it's polluting our lakes and rivers and water streams and polluting our air. And the damage that food production is doing to the environment is so severe that this actually threatens global food security. So this is a vicious cycle that we have to break. I wish I could say that we were done, but unfortunately we are not. The list goes on. Unfortunately, food systems are a major risk and driver of pandemic risk. Uh, through unsustainable expansion of land for agriculture and intensive animal farming, this is rising or driving the risk for virus spillover from uh, animals to people. And 75% of emerging infectious diseases are now due to 
uh, sonotic, well, they are sonotic in origin. Also, our food systems are deeply unjust. Unfortunately, the most, well, food producers and workers are the most marginalized globally, and over the past decades, this has only gotten worse and worse, partially because other actors in the supply chains or the value chains are running away with more and more of the profits. And then escalating food insecurity will and is going to destabilize societies, undermine democracy, and give rise to conflict. The war in Ukraine and its really worrying implications for global food security has shown us, together with the pandemic and climate change, that being overly dependent on a few global bread baskets and a few staple crops, that is incredibly risky. So part of what we need to do is to diversify. We need to more a more localized food system, which Sandrine has been a champion for, uh, for years. And we also need to build more resilience in the system. So more localized production, shorter value chains, but also sustainable food trade. Despite all of this, one third of everything we produce is never eaten, is either lost or wasted in the value chain. And this quantity, guys, could feed 3 billion people, nearly 40% of the global population. Then to my favorite animals, we can't talk about food systems without addressing the elephant or rather the cow in the room. However, good news for all you meat eaters out there, it's not the cow, it's the how. And I'm adding the how many, because the problem today is not cows. Cows and other livestock are natural and important parts of regenerative food systems. They have a role to play, they can even contribute to sequestering carbon. But the problem is that we are overproducing and overconsuming cheap grain fed meat. This figure is from um, uh, Henry Dimbleby's excellent book, Ravenous, that just came out, and is basically showing that the weight of all the animals that we are raising for food is now twice the weight of all people on the planet. And wild animals, wild mammals, only account for 4%. So we are basically slaughtering, raising and slaughtering some 80 billion land animals every year to feed 8 billion people, despite we know that meat and animal proteins is the most resource demanding, water intensive, land use, uh, demanding and carbon emitting way of producing proteins for human consumption. So this is madness on stilts. And adding to that, we are feeding one third of the world's grains to animals. This has to stop, period. If you are a bit overwhelmed right now, I know it's late in the day, but trust me, there is some good news. We can fix food and it's going to be an immense win-win for people and planet. And perhaps the single most important way of accelerating progress towards the sustainable development goals. This report, the Eat Lancet Commission on Food Planet Health, came out in 2019. It created, well, it put internet on fire, not to exaggerate, but it basically put food system transformation on the global agenda like nothing before it. What the commission did was to assess the food system from the twin perspective of human and planetary health. And it basically concluded that it is possible to feed 10 billion people enough healthy food within safe planetary boundaries. However, it showed that it's not going to be easy. It will require radical transformation, major shifts in what we produce and how we consume. And it also importantly showed that these are shifts are eminently doable. No rocket science required. And later on, other major reports, IPCC, IPIS on biodiversity, etc., have basically echoed the findings of this commission. What are we talking about? Basically, four things, four big shifts that have to happen in parallel. The first is about changing what we produce, how we produce it. We need to shift to what we call nature-positive, regenerative food production. 
Meaning that sustainable just do no more harm, that's no longer good enough. We need to restore biodiversity and we need to absorb carbon and restore water flows. And we need more resilience, also more resilient yields. That's production. Then it's about changing what we eat. It's not about a vegan or even a vegetarian future, but it's a shift to healthy, plant-rich, much more diverse diets. Animal proteins still have a role to play, still room, but within means. Then it's about getting rid of all the inefficiencies, slashing food loss and waste, shifting to circular economy. And then lastly, but importantly, it's about securing fair, equitable livelihoods in the supply chains. Then more complicated, how do we now actually achieve these massive shifts. There are a few things. First and foremost, we need to break down the silos. We need to stop looking at food as something, bits and pieces, a jigsaw puzzle. We need to look at the big picture and we need to understand the trade-offs and the synergies and we need to navigate those. And to simplify a bit, uh, let's focus at what needs to happen at the global and then at the national level. But it, does, it really has to go from global to local and the other way around. At the global level, we are talking about um, things as setting targets. Right now, it's a problem that we are lacking a 1.5 degree equivalent, like we have for climate, for food. We know that food systems need to be net carbon sinks, but what exactly does it look like? What does it look like to achieve the sustainable development goals? So targets, important, and these targets need to be given legs and made to matter globally through and by institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, FAO, uh, the World Trade Organizations, etc. And it's really now time to put science at the heart of global governance, and not at least to support governments in translating science into policy. That's a massive need. And then it's about transforming public and private food finance. And then it's about getting the food industry to move. We need to see hard commitments by the industry, also to stop actively lobbying against the changes we need to see. And then, finally, we can't do this without catalyzing a global public movement. As Bono has said, people today have so much more power than the people in power, and we need to get people to demand action from governments and from industry. How do we do this at the national level? Basically, overarching essence of this slide is that we need holistic or integrated science-based strategies, food system strategies, uh, and action plans, investment plans. It has to be about policy reforms. Today, the same government is subsidizing the production of what is killing people and destroying our planets, and doing the exact opposite through the Department or Ministry of Agriculture, as the Ministry of Health would need. So we really need policy co uh, coherence here and policy reforms. And it's about strengthening accountability of the financial sector. It's about, again, ambitious strategies and action by the industry. And yeah, again, supporting and building public movement, local bottom-up uh, support. And interestingly, we are now in Germany, which is one of two countries in the world that have actually succeeded in curbing meat consumption, a result of a successful combination of policies and uh, innovation in the restaurant industry, big food, uh, food tech startups, etc. So congratulations. Other countries, Sweden, actually. And then a few words about the massive opportunities in the transformation. This is a horrible slide, but the essence is really, really important. Uh, there is an estimated annual business opportunity associated with the shifts. These shifts are basically just a breakdown of the four that I talked uh, about. But uh, an estimated business opportunity of 4.5 trillion US annually by 2030 if we shift to sustainable, healthy, resilient food systems. 
Yes, there is an upfront investment, but that's very minor compared to the massive economic gains to society, 5.7 trillion annually by 2030, and more than 10 trillion by 2050 if we do this. Think about the enormous market opportunities in shifting to healthy diets from sustainable food systems, for example. Um, of course, the policy environment matter here, but the EU Farm to Fork strategy, once it becomes implemented, is a sign of what's to come. But even where policies are slow to shift, we see massive opportunities now rising, for example, with alternative proteins and plant-based meat, as an example. So some entrepreneurs and uh, progressive corporates are really leading the charge in capitalizing on these opportunities. However, we need a strategic reframing uh, that today's hidden costs, the externalities, really represents tomorrow's new markets. That has to go mainstream and we need to work together to make that happen. A few words about what EAT is doing to contribute to these major shifts that need to happen. We are zooming in now on three major areas. The first is about generating, updating, expanding these scientific targets. We are now setting up EAT Lancet 2.0 as the de facto interim IPCC for food, because the UN is not doing it. Uh, it's coming early 2020, uh, 2025. Then we are working on a stern review, the economics of food systems, with a big commission coming out later this year. And together with many partners, we have launched a Good Food Finance Network, which is all about rallying the world of finance behind this agenda. And then lastly, we are now working towards a Paris moment for food by COP28 in Dubai in November with the government of the UAE. Uh, which has now committed publicly to put food front and center of the climate agenda. So I really hope that some of you uh, would like to join forces. Please come and talk to me afterwards. And then finally, a few words about why I came into uh, Berlin for this conference. I really believe in girl power, uh, goes without saying. But unless women come to rescue, I doubt that we can fix food or secure a livable future for humanity on this planet, seriously. Uh, we know that obviously female leadership is associated with pro-environmental outcomes. Research shows that a higher proportion of women in parliament is, more, uh, is associated with being more likely to ratify environmental treaties, is more likely to have protected areas and also stricter climate policies. And women leadership styles are also obviously associated with long-term thinking, collaboration, transparency and inclusion. And we as women, we get the power of we, and we need more of that to solve these challenges. So now it's our time as women to step up and also challenge the mostly male-dominated, male-powered Western interests that are blocking uh, transformation. And as women leaders, we need to think about what can we do within our companies, our institutions, our governments, or as citizens and consumers. So last but not least, let's rally other, other fellow sisters behind this agenda. Food is so cross-cutting, uh, it affects all of us. We all have a role to play because at the end of the day, we are all stakeholders. And as Madeleine uh, Albright used to say, there is a special place in hell for women who are not supporting other women. And we don't belong in hell, so let's join forces and go to work. And go big, not home, because that's not an option. Thank you so much.